Welcome everyone, Questine here with a discussion about Emmerich and Patch 3.0 that's going to come alongside the Chaos Dwarves. So how is Emmerich's campaign in this particular patch? Well, if you're hoping that his quest objectives have been changed, no. You still get the quest after the first turn, so on turn 2 you get the quest to Confederate Galador, which requires you to occupy, sack, or loot six different settlements. So his campaign objectives haven't changed, his starting situation hasn't changed over here in the Fortress of Vorag. Though of course things have changed because Drazov now starts in the Black Fortress and Tretch Kremantel's uh, province has also been changed over here with Mount Silverspear being introduced in the desolation of Asgore. So there are some changes but in a lot of ways Emmerich's campaign can feel much the same with the addition of having to fight Drazov. Though fighting Drazov is a bit of a tricky affair because he has a garrison building that gives him the Dreadquake Mortar army ability in the Black Fortress. So that is going to be a bit of an issue. But otherwise, yeah, you still have to take those six different provinces. You're still close enough to Quick Headtaker. You still have to deal with Tretch. And now you get to deal with Drazov at the same time. It would be ideal if you could somehow manipulate the situation in, to your advantage so that Tretch and Drazov fight each other instead of you having to fight them. But chances are if you're going to play Emmerich's campaign at the moment, you're going to end up in the situation where, uh, where you have to fight both Drazov and Tretch. I mean, you can certainly defeat both of them. Uh, the reason is that both Drazov and Tretch are just going to recruit very weak armies early on. They'll recruit a lot, but it's like Drazov will just recruit a bunch of orc laborers, Tretch is going to recruit a bunch of clan rats and Skaven slaves, and of course he'll have some storm vermin and heroes, but mainly weak units. And your elven archers, your initial sun dragon, your dragon princes, Emmerich himself, and your mage uh, hero, also the noble that you can get pretty early on in the campaign, all of those will be able to tackle that if you're careful. If you end up having to fight multiple armies, it can be a bit of an issue. And if you end up getting your entire army annihilated by Drasov's um, army ability, that can be a bit of a problem, as you might imagine. So you need to be careful with Drasov's army ability. He only really has it, I believe, in the Howling Wastes. Uh, over here in this particular campaign, I didn't fight him outside the Howling Wastes, so he obviously had it there, but I'm not sure if he would have it, say, if he is attacking you over here. Now, there's been some changes uh, to landmarks in your particular area. That is probably, those are probably the most substantial changes that Demerick has in his campaign. So, obviously the Fortress of Orang does still have the Tower of the Bloody Tooth, so income, Vampire Corruption, though minus 15% construction cost for all buildings. But then we look at the Bone Gulch, and the Bone Gulch has the Graves of Dragons into the pur uh, Purified Graves of Dragons. So, this is pretty good because it's base. It's a pretty good amount of income. It's also an upkeep benefit for the dragons and dragon princes that you do have in your starting army. So instead of like cheesing the way with uh, with Emmerich, you actually want to take the Bone Gulch on turn one to really improve your economy by quite a bit over here. Then there's a another landmark over here in Bitter Bay. I just took it Bitter Bay for the purposes of the vi this video because. I wanted to see what the landmark would do. So it's a tier 3 landmark, it's Anur, Anural's Tomb, and this gives you influence, diplomatic relations, and 5% campaign movement range. Though you're never going to be able to control this province because there's a Skaven tier 5 settlement over here, and they have a full tier 5 army in the settlement from the very start, and they're probably going to get a second one uh, soon enough in the campaign. And the landmark over here is is okay, but you're going to suffer a lot of vampire corruption if you do get that particular landmark. Plus 50 uh, vampire uh, corruption, though you do get a significant amount of benefits when fighting against the vampire counts, vampire coast, and tomb kings. So if you do decide to go over here against Kalida, you will gain some benefits. So why exactly you'd want to do that? That is ancestors. a different uh, discussion altogether. There's not really a whole lot of benefits in doing so from a territorial, territorial standpoint. So the landmark is good, but mo it's more like, oh, okay, if you can take Naga Shazar, you can make uh, take advantage of this particular landmark. Though you're probably going to need some 
corruption uh, or quite a lot of control benefits over here because the minus 10 control of course that vampire corruption would uh, would give you over here because 50 corruption per turn that is substantial that is absolutely ridiculous it's actually pretty hard to maintain control so you're likely going to have an issue with that but outside of that you just get the addition of having to fight Drazov as opposed to just fighting Tretch early on. And as for the rest of the campaign situation, well, people have asked me, is Grimgore an insane, um, an insane expansionist when controlled by the AI? It's turn 18, and he's just come over here in Noblar country. Yeah. Grimgore is an insane expansionist. He's actually not even at war with Grisus so far, but it is a bit insane when you're thinking about it. I think I, I would probably make a deal with Gorst in this particular campaign. Like, if you're playing Emmerich, you might want to make a deal with Gorst, because he does have an aversion towards you, but it is the kind of aversion that you can actually overcome. Uh, it's my only minus 25 aversion, so you can handle that. Though, who ends up winning that situation is a different uh, discussion altogether, though. It can, it can be that Gorst wins, it can be Greasus wins. The way to tell it is like to see, okay, what is the faction strength that Greasus has? What is the faction strength that Gorst has? And then wait until one of them drops. The one that drops is the one that's lost the fight, and that's the one you don't want to ally. Though bear in mind, allying Greasus is kind of pointless when the steamroller from the north is, is going to hit him full force. Yeah, that is... This is pretty insane. Because, like, look at Grimgor. He's, like, got the full stack of troops with a Wa over here. He's got the second stack, almost a full stack over here with a Wa. Then he's got the third army with seven units. And, of course, the Wa as well. That's going to get... So he's got three full stacks, almost. And then he's got the fourth army over here that he's building. And right now, he, he doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of territory. Like, he has two, let's say... Two entire provinces, one of them with only two settlements. So it's not really that he holds a lot of territory, but that's what makes him even more dangerous. Imagine if he wipes out Greasus, you're going to be in for a hell of a time playing as Emmerich. And that's the thing, if you're playing a Darklands campaign, it doesn't matter who it is. And if it's not Grimgore, you're going to have to deal with Grimgore. Maybe Kolek, but honestly, Kolek wants to deal with Grimgore because he benefits a lot from um, vassalizing him. But everyone else, they're gonna, you're gonna have to fight Grimgore. It can be either early game or it can be late game or mid to late game. Like if you're playing Drazov, obviously you're not gonna be able to rush Grimgore, so you deal with Tretch, you deal with Emmerich, and then Grimgore shows up with like three, three full four stacks on your territory. It's a pretty fun experience, I gotta say. Oh, you just dealt with two legendary lords and maybe had to deal with uh, Gorst as well or someone else around here. No problem, let's just throw the steamroller in, in the game. It is a fun situation, though, I gotta say. It is fun to know that you have that uh, Sword of Damocles right over your head when you're playing a campaign in the Darklands, because a lot of campaigns can feel pretty boring, really, once you overcome some of the initial challenge. Well, it might get boring over here once you kill Grimgore, but until you do that, and it's not so easily done, it is a lot of fun. Kostin here signing out, don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.